Father God, what a, a great reminder for us that you sent your son willingly. He died willingly to save us, and as Nathan said earlier, and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And we are so thankful for that, Lord, understanding that before you, we have nothing. But through Christ, we have everything. Lord, I pray that you would bring life to the words that I'm about to speak, that only the truth would go forth, and only the truth would be received. And I pray it in the precious and awesome name of Christ. Amen. Well, if you weren't here last week, and you didn't maybe watch it online, you may be wondering, who in the world is this guy? A lot of people mistake me for Brad Pitt. Uh, but it's not, it's not Brad, it's me. My name is Dan Pope, and uh, I am, for those of you who weren't here last week and weren't online last week, I am your transitional pastor. Uh, I'm going to just uh, steer the church through these changes with the, obviously with the board and the staff and you as the congregation. And uh, my passion, this is the third church where I've been, uh, since I retired, where I've been a transitional pastor, and I absolutely love what I do. And uh, so I look forward to where God is going to direct us in the next uh, uh, months and, and uh, several months ahead. A, n- a number of years ago, there was a young boy in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the United States, who uh, had cancer. And as a result, he had lost all of his hair. And one night, he, he came home from his treatment, and, and he was feeling kind of down and kind of discouraged, and it was later in the evening, and so he walked in the house, and he, he flipped the light on, and, and, and 50 people jumped out from their various hiding places and yelled surprise. And as he looked at them, he was surprised, certainly because there was 50 people crammed into their living room. But yes, another reason he was surprised that every last one of those people had shaved their heads to look just like him. And the interesting thing is, is that almost all of the major U.S. networks covered that story. Now, in the States, they often say, can any good thing come from Milwaukee? And yet, here they were covering this major event. Why? Well, I think it's because it's a clear demonstration of of love in action. Of people not just saying we love you and we support you in this time of need, but coming alongside and saying we are going to shave our head, we're going to make this sacrifice so that you know that we support you. And of course, love is a common theme today, isn't it? We write songs about it, we write books about it, we write poems about it, we make movies about it. You may not know that romance novels are just about the most popular books in North America. They outsell almost everything else. And even Christians buy in the millions romance novels. And we see The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. Well, I don't personally see it, but... But you got the bachelor and the bachelorette who are, who are just trying to find the love of their life. And they go through, go through all kinds of things. To do that. And I don't know, I, I honestly don't really follow the show, but I don't know if any of them have ever gotten married and stayed together. And, and so we search for love, we crave love. But so much of the world that we, of the love that we see in the world around us is nothing more than talk. But Christian love, Christian love, the love that we ought to be displaying if we are followers of Christ, Christian love is action. It's walking more than it is talking. Jesus demonstrated it in the years that he walked on earth. He demonstrated it in very clear and and, and visible ways. And as was read, he he calls the disciples in the text, and he calls those of us who are his disciples today to do the same thing, to love in very clear and helpful ways, in ways that are productive and, and ways that are reproductive. And before we can be productive or reproductive as a church, as individuals, then we must understand, beloved, that a healthy church is a loving church. 
There's no other way to say it. A healthy church is a loving church. And, and, and God, Jesus instructs us in this text to be like him. I believe that people are drawn to Christ. They're drawn to his church because of the loving and the caring that they see in the experience. Now, they may come for all kinds of reasons. They walk through the door because of a particular ministry that they like. Or something that they've heard about the church. Because the pastor's a good preacher. Whatever it is. But let me tell you this. They will never stay for those things. They will never stay because of the ministry. They'll never stay because of other factors. They'll never stay because the pastor is the greatest preacher on the face of the earth. Let me tell you this. That a newcomer could walk through the doors of Rosewood Park this morning. And I could preach the best message I've ever preached. In fact, the best message in the history of the church. It's going to go down as, wow, this great sermon that was preached on September 29th, 2020. And that person will never come back to this church. Or a person, a newcomer could walk through that door and they come in And I preach the absolute worst sermon ever preached in the history of the church. And that one goes down in history. And when people read about it, they have to plug their nose because the sermon was so bad. But that person comes back. What was the difference? A great sermon and a really bad sermon. The difference will always be the love that they see demonstrated among the people that are already here. Statistics tell us that the average person makes up their mind they're going to come back to that church within the first four minutes. You hear that? The first four minutes that they are here, they already know if they're coming back. I shared this one time in a church, and a guy came up to me and said, I disagree with you. And I said, really? And he says, yeah. He said, the first time I was in this church, I knew in the first two minutes I wasn't coming back. Do people see that love in action among us? This is the key. The key to a family, the key to relationships, the key to the church being all that God intended it to be. Friends, you know this, but I'm going to repeat it, that the church is not to be a country club for the elite. The church is a hospital for the hurting, for the broken. It's it's a refuge for the storm from those who call it home. It's a refuge in the storm. And our challenge, I think, as believers is not to talk a good line about love, but to live a good life of love. And our text this morning tells us three three ways that we can do this, or three things that that love in action produces. And, And we have to understand that Christian love is always an act of love. Have you ever had the same experience that perhaps... I've had that the people who talk to Christians, oftentimes, not always, that oftentimes talk about the value and the importance of love or the value and importance of being people of the word are sometimes those who demonstrate it the least. But we can't do that. Christian love is an act of love. And Jesus tells us in this text that love in action is personal. Love in action is personal. In verse 34, he tells the disciples and us, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now you probably know that in the New Testament, we are called to love God. To love our families, to love our neighbors, to love our wives. And we are even called to love our enemies. But in this context, the context of this particular verse, the command is to love one another. Who's the one another? Take a look around you. 
Whenever the one another is used in the New Testament, it is always referring to the church, to other people in the church. Yes, we're to love God and neighbor and all those things, but in this context, Jesus is saying, love one another, other brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Now stop and think who Jesus is saying this to. He's saying this to the disciples. And the disciples, you know, had different backgrounds and different opinions, just like we all do. And yet Jesus brought all of these people. He chose all of these people to be his followers. And he taught them to love one another. Have you ever thought about this? Or maybe you don't think crazy thoughts like I do. But I thought one time as as I was reading the Gospels, I thought, man, I would love to have been around the campfires with Jesus and the disciples. Because you see, on the disciples, you had a guy named Simon the Zealot. Who's Simon the Zealot? The Zealots were people who wanted to overthrow the Roman government by force. They hated the Romans, and they hated anybody who cooperated with the Romans. And on the same disciple group, you have Matthew the tax collector. He worked for the Romans. He supported the Romans. He helped the Romans to, to, uh, to uh, persecute the people. Now, don't you think around the campfire there might have been the odd discussion about that? These radically different views, and yet Jesus brings them together and just calls them not to, not to be all the same, but to love one another. And the disciples were no different than the Christians today. No different than Christians of any church. They were different and we are different. We have different temperaments, different beliefs, different values. But Jesus calls, beloved, he calls you and he calls me to love one another in spite of the differences. Not to just everybody, let everybody be exactly the same. No, he never once, God never once calls us to agree on everything. He doesn't even say there should be no differences among us. He simply says this, love one another. Because the reality is this, there will be differences among us. There will be different views and about relationships and and different thoughts and, and all of those things. And God asks us if we're willing to love one another Anyway, the command to love one another, you may know that there's, depending on your version, about 63 one another's in the New Testament. The most common of those, surprise, surprise, is to love one another. And so you may be a person who believes quite strongly that the, the, the tongues are for today. But there may be somebody else around you who believes, no, the gift of tongues is gone. Can we love one another in the midst of those? You may be someone who believes that, that the scriptures limit the role of, of women leadership roles in the church. And there may be somebody else who says, no, women can be anything in the church in the church that a man can be. Can we love one another in the midst of that? You may be a person who says that Saskatchewan has a professional football team. And others would say, no way. Well, I expected more groaning than that, but it's all right. I thought I'd reveal my true colors right away. And and, and the word that's used in this passage is a very common word that most of us know, the word agape. This unconditional love for others. Even those that we disagree with, even those that disagree with us, we have this unconditional love. The reality is this, if you wait until you have total agreement, you will never be able to love one another because there's just no such thing. In fact, my wife and I rejoice when we find something that we agree about. Honestly, we disagree on almost everything. And it's only taken us 46 years to work that out until the next thing that we disagree with. That's okay. I love that woman more than any other person on the face of the earth. But we disagree about a lot of things. Another word that's used for love that's not in this text is this word phileo, which it's it's not used in the text, 
But it's certainly included within this scope of agape. And I love this word because it means to delight in someone. To be really fond of someone. To set your heart about about them. And this is something that we need to cultivate as a church. Not Rosewood Park. I think all churches. We need to cultivate this phileo love. That just says, hey, we're buddies. I like you. I like to hang out with you. You're my friend. But again, sadly, the church has not always been this way. The church is probably about the only army that shoots its wounded. And somebody said, yeah, and unfortunately, usually in the back. And that's so often what people outside see the church it's an army that shoots its wounded. But we demonstrate personal love when we commit ourselves, commit ourselves to support and encourage and protect each other. Now, there are times, see, so many people today, we know God is love, but they think love is God. And so we just love people. But there are times when we, have, we know as parents, we know as leaders in a church, we know as a church that there are times when action has to be taken. There are times when we have to say, you need to be responsible for your behavior. Why? Because we love them. Because we love them. And we want them to know That the road that they have taken is not the road that God would have for them. And so loving somebody, this personal love, does not mean that we allow sin to run rampant in the in the family of God. And, And so love in action is personal, but it's also practical. Jesus goes on in verse 34 to tell us how to love one another. He says, love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Elizabeth Browning said this, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. But Christian love is different than that, beloved. Christian love says, how do I love thee? Let me show you the ways. Let me show you the ways that I love you. And then the same, same author says, John says in 1 John 3, 18, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So people see that we love them and that we love others. Jesus' love is very practical. Earlier in John 13, he washes the feet of the disciples. And have you ever noticed, read through the Gospels sometime and just make a note, every time Jesus does something kind for another person, just look at how much of his ministry was simply spent doing nice things, kind things for other people and simply caring for people. Because a practical love means more than just seeing that people have needs. Oh man, that person really could use this. And then saying, I'm going to pray for them and walk away. Practical love is so much different. Practical love says, love says that person has a need. God, use me. Use me to God to help meet that need. James 2, 16 and 17 says that if we see a brother or sister without food and clothes and we say to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Isn't that something? What good is that? If all we say to them is go, be filled, be warm and be filled. In fact, James says that if we, if we see that and we do nothing, he says, you are practicing dead religion. I don't want to practice dead religion in my life. 
And I don't think you as a church want to practice dead religion. We want to practice active love in our body and in our families and, and, and genuine love. It's more than just a hospitable and kind attitude. It, 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 it's more than just being, just being nice. It's revealed in our actions because love in action is service to others. Love in action is service to others. Practical love often involves sacrifice and, and service to other people. And Jesus demonstrated this because when he washed that disciple's feet, he was doing the job not just of a servant, he was doing the job of the lowest servant in a Jewish household. They were at the bottom of the tier of servants. And that's the role that Jesus chose to take on. I will wash their feet. And then he does something amazing. He washes their feet. And then he looks around him at the disciples. Do you remember what he said? Go and do likewise. He said that to them and he says it to us. When you see me, the example that I set in washing the disciples' feet, go and do likewise. And then in Luke 10, Jesus uses the, the good Samaritan. Remember that story? The, the, the guy is, is going down to Jericho, and he gets robbed and beaten, and he's lying at the side of the road, and the priest comes by. And what does he do? He crosses the road. This is a priest. And he crosses the road, and he goes down. And then a Levite comes, kind of an assistant priest. And, and he comes, and he sees him, and he goes across the road. And then the Samaritan comes, a dreaded enemy of a Jew. And what does he do? You know what happens. He binds him. And he takes him to an inn. And, and, and he, he gives the finances to help that man stay there and recover. The priest and the Levite may well have felt pity. But what we know for sure they didn't feel Christian love. But Christian love would never let them walk by that poor man laying there. They would know that they had to do something. Really, love... Love is not really Christian life until we give it away. No matter how much we tell, say that love fills my heart. It's not really the love of Christ until we give it away. And God calls us to share Christ's love, Christ's hope, Christ's comfort wherever we go. To help build a, a healthy church where those are, who are attend and are part of that church are encouraged and loved and, and, and also challenged to grow in their faith. And I believe that this kind of a church, although he's talking about love another, one even one another, will be a tremendous witness to those who do not know Jesus. I believe that a healthy church is one of the greatest outreach tools that we have. I honestly believe that. That a church where people come in and see the love of Christ, I believe that will be a tremendous outreach to others. So love in action is personal, it's practical, and then Jesus goes on in verse 35 to remind us that love in action is is productive. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And I think that productive love is the result of personal love and practical love lived out in our lives. And then I begin, I think that it begins to produce things. It, it, it produces changes in people. And maybe people right within the church that have struggled with things for a long time will suddenly begin little by little to experience freedom. And maybe sometimes through a miracle of God, pow, an instantaneous freedom from things that they wrestled with for a long time. And maybe people will come in from outside the church, those who do not yet know Jesus, and they come in and they see the love and, and they recognize that they need to change too. And they begin to step forward. Maybe not all cross the line at one time, but, but week by week they take a step closer to the cross. 
and draw closer to giving their lives to him. I think the two of the greatest needs that every human being on the face of the earth, no matter how soft or hard they might appear to be, is this need to give and receive love. William Sandler, a psychologist, said, the sincere acceptance of love would wipe out over half the world's diseases, sicknesses, and sorrows. I don't know if that's actually true, but I can tell you this, it will change a lot of people. It will bring a lot of healing to people to be genuinely loved by others. A productive love reaches out and overflows. It's a kind of love that was shown by the prodigal father or the son, father to the prodigal son. He sees him coming from a long way off and he runs and he forgives him. I mean, a tremendous offense in that day would have been for that young man to go to his dad and said, I know you're not dead, but I want my money now. And the father sees him, and he goes running, and he demonstrates this kind of productive love, and the son is changed. And then there's the other brother, the other brother, who instead of bringing healing, could easily have brought further division to that family, further brokenness to the other brother, to the son, the prodigal son. And I'm sure... I, I would be surprised if I said to anybody here, if I said to you, okay, if you don't want to be this kind of a church, if you don't demonstrate this kind of love, just put your hand up. I don't think there would be a single hand that went up. I think if you're a part of a church, you want the church to be this kind of a church. And I think this is how we all want Rosewood Park to be known in the Regina and in the surrounding area. What an awesome thing to think that when you're talking to somebody and you, oh, do you go to church? I go to Rosewood Park. Rosewood Park? I hear that that's the most loving church in Regina. What an awesome thing. What an awesome thing to be known as the most loving church in the city. I'm sure you want to be seen as a loving, caring church that reaches out to one another with a personal and a practical love that is productive. I'm sure that you want to be seen as a church that is trying to live out by the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ's command to love as he did. There is so much, so much, so much power in productive love. Paul Tournier, Christian psychiatrist, said that love and friendship bring healing. Love and friendship bring healing. I don't know if, if you have heard of a man named Dave Reaver. Dave Reaver was, uh, was a soldier in the Vietnam War. And uh, they were uh, fighting some snipers in the forest and one of the things that they would do is throw these phosphorus grenades and and burn down the forest so they could find the the snipers so he pulls back this grenade and right about here six inches from his face the sniper hits the grenade and it blows up and dave reaver is quite actually on fire not his clothes his body and he jumps in the water, but phosphorus isn't affected by water. And so here he is in the water, but he's still burning. And he was burned so severely that they, they didn't know if he was going to live or die. In fact, let me ruin your lunch for you. This is what he looked like. He said that when he looked in the mirror, he could see inside of his chest. He quite literally, through a hole, could see his heart beating. Half of his face was gone. You could see right inside his mouth. All the fingers on one hand were gone. And his ear is gone. That's what he sees. The interesting thing is he actually became, after he was injured, a very good piano player. And somebody came up to him one time and said, I, learned, I heard that you play the piano by ear. And he said, well, I can. And he took his ear off and went like this.
And now Dave Reaver is facing the most frightening day of his life. He's back in the United States and his wife Brenda is coming to see him for the first time since he was hurt. And to make things even worse, worse, just before she comes in, the wife of the man in the bed next to him comes and looks at him and says out loud, you're embarrassing, I couldn't walk down the street with you. Took off her wedding ring and put it on one of his toes. And now Brenda's coming in. And you can imagine how Dave Reaver feels. She comes in, she doesn't know which person it is in the room. So she takes her, her chart off the end of the bed, and yes, it's, it's him, but she's still not sure because he's so badly burdened. And, and, and so she takes a look at the toe tag, and it's his name. And what does she do? She walks over, and she leans over the bed, and she kisses him. And she says, welcome home, Davy. Now you see, Davy was her pet name for him. Nobody else called him Davy except her. And she leaned over and she kissed him. And Dave Reaver said this, and I think it's an absolutely powerful, powerful statement. He says, determination kept me alive, but it took love to heal the wounds. Determination kept me alive but it took love to heal the wounds. And so my call to us this morning is let's join together. In spite of, of all that has transpired in the past few years in our church, let's stand together and make God's church here at Rosewood Park a place where love is visible and active and wounds are healed. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love which overflows to us every day. So often, Lord, we think we can live our lives or live a life of love without you. And I would ask every day that those of us here today, those of us online, every day would begin our day by saying, Jesus, fill me with your love so that I can be a vessel of that love to my spouse, to my children, to my extended family, to those I work with, and to the church that I attend. And we ask it in Christ's wonderful and glorious name. Amen.